Well, welcome everyone uh, to tonight's webinar, uh, Secrets of Sunflowers, More Than Meets the Eye, A Natural History of Sunflowers. This is the second webinar in our Science and Conversation series, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, and tonight's webinar is featuring Dr. Nora Mitchell, and I will introduce her more fully shortly as well. Uh, so my name is Jesse Rack. I'm the program director at the Natural History Institute here in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, and I first wanna say a couple of words about the Institute for those of you who are not familiar with our work. So the Natural History Institute is a mission-based independent nonprofit organization in here in Prescott, Arizona. And our mission is to provide leadership and resources for a revitalized practice of natural history, integrating science and arts in the humanities. Uh, we believe that everyone can participate in the practice of natural history and that by so doing, they can learn to care for the world and in return, reap the mental and physical health benefits of nature. Um, so I want to bring your attention to a couple of resources that the Institute has to offer. Uh, one is our website. It's just naturalhistoryinstitute.org. You can see it in the chat right there. My colleague has thrown it in there. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and that has all sorts of information on there, including upcoming programs. We do programs, we do speaker series, we do in-person workshops and field experiences if you're local. Um, we even do some farther flung touchstone tours where we'll take people to a, 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 a destination and learn about that. <clears throat> All of our in-person talks, we live stream as well. So even if you're not in the area, you can check those out. Next up, we have one on January 12th. Uh, I'll be giving a talk on amphibians and reptiles. It's rescheduled from December. Um, and we also have the rest of this science and conversation webinar series that's gonna be rolling out through the spring. So our next, uh, our next here's the, the, there's a link in the chat to the whole lineup. Um, the next up one is Wednesday, January 8th. We will be doing a natural history of pike which if you're unfamiliar, you should come to that one because they're the cutest um, high altitude alpine potatoes, basically. They're like furry <laughs> potatoes. They're mammals. Um, they're very cute. Um, I also wanted to say that if you're so inclined to consider supporting the work of the Natural History Institute, like all small, small nonprofits, this is a labor of love. Your support is so important. It's so necessary to our continued work. If you're interested, on the homepage of our website is a link to donate. <clears throat> So a couple of things about how this is going to work in terms of the logistics of the program here tonight, in terms of kind of Zoom protocols. So a lot of people, thank you to everyone who's introducing yourself in the chat and sharing where you're from. I love that. Um, just to let you know, we'll be turning the chat off momentarily. We've just found it a bit distracting if people are kind of chatting back and forth during the program. So that'll be off. But in its place, we will be using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen here. Um, so it's on the, the right side there at the bottom, looks like little cartoon speech bubbles that will be on throughout the whole program. So if at any time you have a question for Nora or a comment you'd like to make, we will save the last 10 minutes and address those later in the evening. <clears throat> Also, if you see someone has asked a question or made a comment that along the lines of what you were going to say, instead of asking the same thing, there's a, a thumbs up icon there. And so you can kind of upvote these questions and then we'll, we can, those will come to the top and we'll see those. <clears throat> Finally, as I mentioned, as you're arriving, this program will be recorded and available on the Natural History Institute's YouTube channel. Um, so it'll be available right after this presentation. If you pop back in tomorrow, I'll have trimmed off the beginning as people are arriving. Uh, so it'll be an edited version. So please check that out. Feel free to share with folks if you're so inspired. Um, so now with that, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest here tonight, Dr. Nora Mitchell. Uh, so Dr. Mitchell is a plant evolutionary biologist with a specialty in plant hybridization. We're gonna learn all about that in a minute. <clears throat> she received her PhD at the University of Connecticut and she did a postdoc at the University of New Mexico. Uh, she is currently an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, where she teaches courses ranging from introductory organismal biology to plant diversity and evolution. She's performed extensive field work in South Africa, where she studied protea, so we can ask her about that later if you want, uh, and in the United States, ranging from the Northeast to the Southwest and now the Upper Midwest. Um, she is passionate about undergraduate education and inspiring everyone to gain an appreciation for plants. 
Uh, in her free time, she also coaches and plays ultimate frisbee. You can ask about that if you want, but I can't guarantee we'll get to it. Um, <laughs> in any event, I'm delighted to be here with her this evening. Thank you so much, Nora, for joining us. <laughs> and thank you, Jess. Thank you, Jesse, for that lovely introduction. Oh, we can't hear you. Can you turn your mute and then unmute? Can you hear me now? Nope. Maybe try your headphones. Wow, we just tech checked this. Thank you all for your patience. We'll make this work. Don't worry. <laughs> How about now? No, that's interesting. Hmm. Hang on one second. We yes. just had this working. Oh, can you guys in the chat hear her before we turn it off? Because I can't hear her. Are they, Anyone? The Q&A says they can hear. You can hear her. Oh, interesting. For some reason, I can't hear you which is fascinating. That is fascinating. <laughs> okay. Huh. Hang on one second. Thank you everyone for your patience while we troubleshoot this because that's weird. Hmm. It always happens, right? When you're, as soon as you go live. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I need to fix my... Okay, say something now, Nora, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Got you. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> Back on track. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Woohoo. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for the suggestion that I, I needed to switch over my sound. You don't care about that. Let's get started. Welcome, Nora. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for Justin. Your patience as well. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, great. So again, we'll be turning off the chat now. So a reminder, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so Nora, I'm going to get started with kind of a broad question and then we'll yeah. zero in on sunflowers, which is what everyone came to see, of course. <clears throat> so we here at the Natural History Institute, clearly, like I, I asked you to frame this discussion around sunflowers and around, um, around the, uh, the natural history of sunflowers. So we here at the Natural History Institute, we actually do have a, a formal definition of natural history that, um, that, uh, that we like to employ. And so we define it as a practice. So it's very important that we consider it a practice. So, so something that, that you do. Um, the practice of intentional focused attentiveness and receptivity to the more than human world guided by honesty and accuracy. Ooh. So yeah, so I don't think I told you that before. Um, I kind of would like to kind of check in with you and see how do you define natural history and where do you see it in your work? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love that definition. That's, I don't know if I could have come up with those words, but to me, I think, <laughs> to me, I think natural history is really getting to know again, to know in different ways, the non-human world. So just like you stated, it's not just about extraction or, you know, taking data. It's about really getting to know those organisms, know how they function uh, where they're found, who they're interacting with, and all of these other aspects of just kind of how they live. So from, you know, birth until death, what's going on with those organisms throughout different seasons, throughout their lifetime. Um, yeah, just who they're interacting with, where you can find them, and that kind of intimate knowledge that only really comes from interacting with them in a more, just in a more kind of in-depth way. So it's not just looking at something quickly or taking a sample. It's really understanding how they function. And I think that's really important for asking and answering any sort of biological or scientific question, where if you don't know your study organism, you're going to miss a lot of things. Um, I think that's that's how I see it a lot. Yeah, I like how you said that because it, it very much parallels what I defined of like mm -hmm. it's the the attentiveness and receptivity bit that that is kind of exactly what you're describing, yeah. which I love. Um, great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so we're going to kind of back all the way up and I'd love to kind of hear if you could describe a little bit for us of like your personal pathway to becoming a botanist, like maybe the, the path of you falling in love with plants and falling in love with the world. I want to hear all of it. Yeah, definitely. So growing up, I have loved plants since I was pretty small overall, pretty young. Um, I have a picture of myself as a baby to toddler, maybe mm, a year and a half old where I'm standing there 
very short and my face is just in a tulip. So just really inhaling that tulip. And, you know, I have another picture that parallels that from this past spring. So I think I had this inherent love for plants. And I think a lot of that came from my family. Uh, my mom especially was very into gardening. She had worked at a florist shop growing up. So she knew plants and, you know, knowing some of the common names of garden plants was just kind of, you know, that's just what we talked about. That's what we discussed. You know, sometimes in addition to normal chores, my chore would be to go out into the fields and find some wildflowers for the table. Um, I grew up in Western New York, outside Rochester, New York, um, which is pretty far from New York City, like six and a half hours, depending on traffic from New York City drive-wise. So kind of bordering on a more suburban versus rural area out in old farmland. And so we had these old fields, um, old like horse farm fields that used to be potato fields in the 1800s that I lived on um, with my family. And so I just go out there and kind of be in nature a lot on my own. It was fairly, you know, cordoned off from other people. So it was safe and just kind of exploring nature in that way. Um, you know, finding little trees to play with, uh, play in, finding snails and things to play with. So just kind of getting that natural history feel as a pretty young kid. We also did a lot of camping and stuff like that, where we'd be out in nature a lot. Um, yeah, so I kind of had that inherited love of plants, was constantly gardening. And then, you know, once I got to college, even before then, like in high school, I love the plant units in high school, like being able to work with the plants. I remember we did some little experiments with plants, just like altering sunlight and stuff like that. And I love doing that. And then once I got to college, I took more plant courses. I fell in love with this field botany and plant natural history course, actually, um, in the school I went to in Western Massachusetts, uh, Williams College. And I loved it so much that I asked the professor if they were looking for any, you know, research students for this for the summer. And so I ended up working with her for a couple years while at while in college, doing field work ranging from being in Massachusetts, looking at invasive species and trying to document different types of pollen in the area. And then I actually got to spend an entire summer in Isle Royale National Park, which is way up far north in Lake Superior. Um, and I believe is the least visited national park in the United States. It's pretty difficult to get to, um, but just really being immersed in the plants and having time to like, again, be part of that natural history. We were living there for, I think, about six weeks um, in cabins uh, off the main island. So we had no electricity, no running water. Um, no distractions, no cell phone service or anything like that. Um, we checked the mail twice a week by kayaking about a mile and a half to go check the mailboat and coming back with the mail. Um, and so that was, again, really immersive. And I absolutely loved it. Like I'd always loved plants. I hadn't really considered the possibility of having a career in plants until having those experiences. And then going to grad school, I also, you know, dove into plants, but that's another story. <laughs> checking the mail by boat. That's pretty yeah, hard. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> Sometimes... <laughs> I love that your chores as a child involved like going and picking a bouquet of flowers. Yeah. I was like, wait, was that a non-normal chore? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And actually, I identified a lot with kind of your your story because I grew up in New York State as yeah. well. Um, except I was like, oh, get out of the way, plants. I'm looking for salamanders. <laughs> but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but no, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's so interesting to kind of hear the origin stories of scientists and hear like, what led them and kind of what curiosities drove them and how often it just comes from this place of natural history of climbing around in trees and like asking questions and being curious. So thank you so much. Of course. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna cut right to the chase here because okay. my kind of big question that's probably way too big for this is just like, why sunflowers? <laughs> um, so I, when I think of sunflowers, I picture, you know, the big garden plant, right? And like, mm -hmm. that you eat the seeds. What, what else are they? And why do they matter? Why should, why do we care? <laughs> so the way you define sunflower also varies. So in kind of a strict sense, the most narrow sense, um, a sunflower is any species within the genus called helianthus. Helianthus comes from Greek, literally helios, Anthos literally means sunflower. Um, and so the very strictest sense of sunflower are is anything in that genus, which is just a taxonomic level above the species. Um, and there are about 70 different species of sunflowers out there, which is um, a fair amount of natural diversity. It's not the largest genus, but I think there's really incredible natural diversity of sunflowers. And so 
you know, we think about the domesticated or cultivated sunflowers, either, you know, the grocery store um, seeds and baseball players eating seeds or the oils or those beautiful, like giant heads, the, the Instagrammable fields, right? So, um, and those are sunflowers, but there's so many other types of sunflowers out there, which I think makes them a really amazing, just an amazing opportunity opportunity to study all sorts of questions about plants and plant evolution overall in a really charismatic system. Um, the other way to define sunflower is through the family that they're in, sometimes called the sunflower family, sometimes called the aster family. It's got a lot of names because it's probably the largest plant family out there. So if we think about tax taxonomic levels, which is just the way that biologists organize um, life. Essentially, we have species and then genus above that and then family above that. And so the sunflower family um, has about 33,000 different species in it. So if we're defining sunflowers at just the genus, it's about 70. If it's the entire family, it's maybe 33,000. Um, wow. Orchids are about the same size. Oh, the orchid really? family is about the same size. Um, but again, there are species that we haven't discovered yet or that still being discovered. So, you know, there's a little bit of back and forth between which family is bigger. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was about to ask which was the biggest family. Cause I yeah. always think I just assumed asters because when I don't know a plant in nature, I just say it's an aster. Um, so Jesse Rack, personal observation, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but no, I had no idea there were that many work. It's probably because I have this like North America bias. Yeah, and they're definitely. Really oh, fascinating. Cool. Oh, that's amazing. So, okay. So uh, you started to tell us a little bit, I'm sorry if I jumped in, no. um, about how, because this family is so big, you can tell us stuff about evolution. Can you dive into that a little bit? Like how, how? Yeah. Basically? So that's, that's a big question. And actually one of oh. Charles, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good. One of Charles Darwin's biggest questions or biggest like conundrums that he faced, um, was, he called the sudden rise or sudden appearance and then explosion in diversity of the flowering plants overall as a quote unquote abominable mystery. So that's again, <laughs> thinking about just this rise in number of plants really suddenly in the flowering plants overall. And so that's a big question is like, why are there so many flowering plants? And then the way that that diversity is structured within flowering plants, like why are there so many in the sunflower family or why there's so many asters and so few, you know, of this other group. And so that's something that we're, that I'm trying to still look at. And I think, you know, people love to argue about it's gotta be this one thing or it has to be this one other thing. But I think really there's a combination of factors that make it, the family so large or so diverse mm -hmm. and really good for studying evolution overall because we have lots and lots of species. How do they coexist? How do they come to be? Um, just to demonstrate a point, this is a guide to the family of Asteraceae, the Aster family okay. in just the United States, contiguous okay. United States. So okay. not, you know, the continental US. And normally when we think of a guide, it's to the species level, right? And we wanna know exactly what species this specimen is or this plant yeah. I see in, in the wild. Um, this one's to the genus level. And you can see it's quite thick. <gasps> <laughs> and this one's actually cool because it's color coded also. So each color is uh, mm -hmm. taxonomic level even below the family because it's so big. You, you can't just have like 33,000. You have to sub further subdivide it. And yeah. so you can see, maybe you can see, it's hard, I know it's a little bit hard that some of those colors are, there's like a lot of pages of that color. Yeah. And some it's just like not as many. And so even uh, within this one family, the structure is just kind of all over the place. And so, you know, you can ask, okay, so why is this group so, have so many species and this one that's very closely related has only a handful of species. Yeah. And so with the sunflower family or the asters, it's um, a couple ideas. So potentially because there's so many, what we call secondary compounds or secondary chemicals in oh. the group. Is that um, like the defensive ones that they use against bugs? Like, yeah, like exactly. The ones? Okay. So these, these secondary compounds, it's really anything that's like extra. So primary compounds are the things that they need to like absolutely live, like sugar and, um, you know, starches and those kind of like mm -hmm. things that every plant absolutely needs, you know, okay. like humans need to have yeah. food, humans have bones and muscle, right? And then plants have these extra things that some of them have and some don't. And a lot of those have to do with defense compounds. Um, oh. So they have all these chemicals that like, taste bad to insects or that smell bad or just basically 
many of them are deterring insects from coming towards them um, because you know the plant does not want to be eaten. So these chemical compounds can help contribute to that. And the other, like the other thing that I really love about the sunflower family, and this is maybe getting kind of away from the original question, um, is just how intricate and fascinating their flower heads are. Mm. Um, so if you ever look closely at any member of the sunflower family, this goes for like sunflowers themselves, asters, dandelions, I think are a really great example oh. of this. Yeah. Because dandelions are so common and like no one really feels bad picking a dandelion and looking at it really closely because there's, you know, they're, yeah. Uh, they're, yeah. Depending where you are, they're pretty much everywhere and often regarded as a weedy plant. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just going to share a picture real quick. Yeah. And... Explain what your, your favorite thing is. Yeah. So this is a picture of a sunflower head. This is um, related to the cult, you know, base of the cultivated species. But so you can just like, oh, this is a sunflower, right? right? That's like, but this is actually not just one flower. This is thousands of flowers in Wait, one what? overall structure. Yeah. Wait, how? It's, they are really tiny. So in, in Helianthus, so in like the sunflowers in the most strict sense, they have these outer flowers. So these that look like what we think of as just these yellow petals, that's actually an entire flower. What? <laughs> yeah. That's a different flower from the inside ones? Yeah. So there's, um, in these sunflowers, there's two different types of flowers. There's these outside ones, which we call ray florets. The trim florets, F-L-O-R-E-T. That just means little flower. So these little oh. flowers. And the ray ones on the outside are bright and generally yellow, although there is some diversity in color also. Mm -hmm. Generally the yellow part that's really showy and really attractive to insects, which I think we will mm -hmm. also get to later. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I want to talk about pollinators. And then these oh, ones, yeah. these these outer flowers are actually sterile, which means they don't have any of the, the working reproductive parts to them. Oh. So, you know, you can, if you have a dandelion or a sunflower, you can pluck these off and count them and they will vary between species and even within a species between individuals, it will vary. Oh. But the business part is this inside. So inside here, there's usually a couple thousand, often a couple thousand little flowers in here. Um, so if you have the time and the energy, uh, you can pull each of these out and count them if you really want to. Oh, and um, each one makes one seed. Each one will make one little seed, one little oh. fruit inside of there. So we can, um, and what's really cool is they have this radial pattern to them. So if you look really closely, especially it's easier to see in a large cultivated sunflower just because everything's blown up. So it's just easier to, to look at. Yeah. They have this really cool pattern to them where the, the seeds and the flowers all fit nicely together, um, kind of mirroring some like Fibonacci, like numerical sequences. And I'm not a mathematician, cool. but the, the patterning is like really cool. People study these things. Is that like the golden ratio thing? Yeah. 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 I I'm only really... know enough to like say that. I don't know yes. what that means. <laughs> Same. I'm like, it's, yeah. Essentially, like you can pack in within a circle, you can pack in the most number of flowers if they follow this pattern. I think that's Dang. basically oh, the gist so of it. Cool. Yeah. So cool. And so each of these little ones is a flower and they actually go through different phases at different times too. Oh, I can so, see that here in this picture. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, you can see how these ones, they look a little bit different from these ones. And then the center looks different also. So essentially they are developing, the outside ones develop first and then the inside ones develop. So it's like this wave oh. of development. And the way the development goes, I'll show you the next picture. Um, oh. So we have, uh, this is like the inside. Here we have the outside. The inside ones, these are flowers that are not yet open. And you can see these flowers look really interesting. They are five petaled, but they have five tiny little petals. What? The colors vary between species, but they're usually pretty dark. Um, so these are harder to, to see, but they will first go through what we think of as a male phase or micro phase where the flowers will produce pollen. So maybe you can see here like this, this pollen, um, pollen from the ant, pollen found right here. And that's a little flower in male phase. You can see how tiny these are. Okay. Um, so again, these ones have not opened yet. These ones have just opened in male phase and these ones are more developed and are currently in the female phase. Oh my um, gosh. So if you're familiar with plant, you need to be familiar with plant morphology, but you can kind of see we have five petals here. 
they're fused together. There's like a yellow tube. And then these five petals have this kind of maroonish tinge to them. And then this is where the female parts are. And we have this feathery kind of bifurcating or forked tongue looking pattern to them. It almost looks like a little uh, moth antennae on top. Um, and that's really feathery and sticky. So pollen will stick to that. And then um, the pollen tube can go down to fertilize the eggs down here. But it does this whole pattern where, you know, the outside ones are male and now the inner ones are male and these ones are female and it just progresses that way too. So you can kind of get a feel for like how that development's happening and this allows for pollination to occur there too. That's cool. Yeah, it's really fun. And oh I my just, gosh. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say like, this is fascinating. It kind of speaks to that. Um, what you were mentioning before about just like getting really close and noticing things like this is the literal thing of that. Like I, um, I just want to like go put my face in the sunflower kind of. <laughs> it's really fun. I, I was trying to find a sunflower, like to a cut one to bring to you, but unfortunately it's, it's winter here in Wisconsin. So they're not as easily accessible. <laughs> I could have yeah. found one, but um, yeah. So that's, what a sunflower looks like and then all the other you know 33,000 members of the family have some some version of that right so things like thistles are in the family too and thistles look super different but they also have lots and lots of little flowers and so kind of freeing up that architecture almost to the flower means that you can have lots and lots of different styles almost yeah. you can think of it as like design like interior design or like de decorations right all sorts of different ways that they can look and function too Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for doing such a fantastic job of tackling what was essentially the broadest question ever. Like what are sunflowers <laughs> and how, why, are, why do they matter? So thank you for, for doing that. Um, so I, great. Um, well, I'd like to kind of, before we get to your personal research, mm -hmm. I want to get to um, kind of another aspect of natural history. So I want to, um, I want to ask you about kind of, I know, humans have had a long history with sunflowers. Uh, and I want to know if you can kind of tell us a little bit about, I know this is a little bit outside of your realm, but maybe it isn't. Um, Cause I'd like to know the kind of uh, the humans and natural history together thing. So yeah, yeah. definitely. So sunflowers are cultivated species and we currently cultivate sunflowers for a couple different reasons, um, but we can look back and think about, okay, how long have humans and sunflowers been coexisting like this for so long? Um, and so the best estimates we have, and there's some debate here, the best estimates are that sunflowers were first domesticated about 4,000 years ago. And there's two potential locations as to where that happened, either somewhere in Eastern North America, like in oh, around the present day United States Southeast, potentially there or potentially in Mexico. Um, so there's some debate about that. If they were first domesticated in North America, they're one of one of very few species to first be domesticated in North America. We have lots that are mm -hmm. domesticated elsewhere in the world in South America, but very few in North America, it turns mm -hmm. out. Um, so that's kind of up for debate exactly where it was. And that's because this evidence is often based off of archaeological sites. So um, one, finding archaeological sites can be difficult. And then um, estimating the age of that site, and then also estimating whether or not there's evidence for sunflowers, and then whether or not those sunflowers were domesticated. There's like multiple mm -hmm. levels to, you know, it's hard to say exactly whether or not this was a domesticated sunflower and when it happened. Mm -hmm. But for instance, they can show that if the if, and this is a big if, not everything preserves well either. So, um, you know, just be, you think about things decaying in your yard, you know, things will decay pretty quickly sometimes. If I leave a pumpkin pumpkin app too long after Halloween, it does not look good after a yeah. week, couple of weeks. Um, so things, some things get preserved pretty well and some things don't. So for sunflowers, when they're looking at whether or not any preserved remains have been domesticated, they're usually looking at the size of the, the seed or the size of the akin and really the shell that's left over. Oh, okay. What usually preserves because the domesticated ones, like I have some props, Domesticated ones, when we go to the grocery store, you know, you think of uh, these sunflower seeds, right. you know, the ones, the baseball players you can see spitting out and my note card go. Um, I'll just gonna hold one up for reference for you. So this is what that sunflower fruit or seed would look like the grocery store bought one. Right, right. So it's, you know, 
I know it's, that one. I eat that one. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty big. It's not like an apple, but it's pretty decently sized. Um, and then I'm gonna hold up one from a wild sunflower. Get your get your reading glasses on because it's right what? there. What? Yes. Oh my it's gosh. Very small. This is not. I don't think I've ever looked at a wild sunflower seed. Yeah, and this is actually not the smallest. There again, there's there's seventy species. This is not the smallest mm-hmm. seed out there. Um, but you know, pretty right. different. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. So humans have essentially domesticated sunflowers and selected them to have larger seeds. Select them for all sorts of things. One thing is to have larger seeds to have higher oil content because most sunflowers commercially are grown for actually oil and not for the seeds. Um, and then to also change their complete shape of the plant itself. So can most, I ask you a brief yeah. question? I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. To interrupt. Go ahead. Um, just to be clear, domestication mm-hmm. in this case, because when I think about domestication, I think about like dogs and cats. Oh, what does yeah. it mean to domesticate a plant? Like just having it in your garden? Yeah, basically any sort of like architect or agriculture architecture. I'm already thinking about that. Uh, any yeah. sort of agriculture. So okay, okay, okay. about cultivating them. So take you know, planting them purposefully, harvesting them purposefully, and then replanting the next year um, purposefully rather than you pick the ones that have your favorite traits and keep yeah. those. Okay, okay. Keep those ones for the next for the next season, um, as opposed to you know foraging for plants where you just go out and you know, take harvest from nature what you want, but don't necessarily take that plant and put it someplace purposefully right. necessarily. Okay. Um, so when I say we selected for those, by we I mean human, human, like humans overall, um, yeah. not me personally, but they selected for a number of different traits. And one of the things that people that I think people are surprised by, and I would, you know, makes sense, um, most wild sunflowers have lots and lots of flower heads on them. So yeah lots of smaller flower heads they have branches to them um and again depending where you are you might have lots of native sunflowers near you growing the roadside or you might not um but we think of the cultivated ones having one big stalk one giant flower head but the wild ones have lots and lots of branches coming off of them and lots and lots of little flower heads and so humans have selected for fewer branches larger heads more oils bigger seeds um because that's what we wanted from them both aesthetically and in terms of uh, nutrition, nutritional output too. And so the end of the story is that when I, when you say sunflower, I picture the garden sunflower. Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. And well, yeah, I also love sunflowers because they're culturally like really relevant. Every, you know, everyone knows what a sun, not everyone, I want to say that, but they're very commonly known. Um, mm-hmm. They're what I like to call a charismatic megaflora. These like yes. big, happy rays of sunshine, um, sunflowers, <laughs> right? I don't know if I did. I <laughs> will not claim credit for that, but I definitely use it a lot more. You're like than trademark. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. may have like taken that from someone else, so I will not Love say it. that I made it up. But yeah, I mean, you could look at art. Van Gogh painted sunflowers. Georgia O'Keeffe painted sunflowers. And, you know, when I give talks to students, I'm like, look at Emojipedia. Sunflower is one of the first plants out there. So, you know, people recognize sunflowers. Um, And in terms of, you know, thinking about how important they are today as a crop species, they're not the most important or most economically important crop in the United States. That's definitely corn and then soybeans. Um, But there are, and I'll have to like look at, so they're not planted worldwide in terms of crops. So Mm -hmm. throughout Europe, parts of Europe, Western and Eastern Europe, Asia, um, parts of Africa, South America, the Middle East. So some some flowers are planted a lot of places, pretty much every continent, except for Antarctica as a crop now, um, which is pretty amazing. And um, they're one of the top four oil seed crops in the in the world. Um, So like palm oil, soybean oil and canola are ahead of sunflowers. But number four is that's still a fair amount of oil. there are about 1.3 million acres of planted sunflowers in the United States, mostly in, the, in, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, and mostly those are oil seed crops too. Um, not so much the, you know, uh, biggest showy ones. They're mostly found in the Great Plains, mostly in North and South Dakota. Oh. In terms of economic impact, they're also, in 2021, they were worth about $600 million in the United States. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's a lot of money. I mean. A lot of money overall, maybe not compared to corn or some other industries, obviously, but still a hefty amount of, of um, money involved there, or, you know, economics. 
And so that's one of the great things about sunflowers is that they have this amazing natural diversity that's like, I'm like, why are there so many sunflowers? Why do they look so cool? What's up with that? And then they have this economic importance. So, you know, it's people like them. They're worth some money to some people and then their natural diversity. So you can study them from kind of multiple angles um, to get at different questions. Oh, that's, you know a lot about that question. And, and also, <laughs> I love that there's also this history of humans and, and sunflowers, I almost said salamanders, humans and sunflowers <laughs> going back for, yeah. for thousands and thousands of years. And that's mm -hmm. really fantastic. So we've always kind of seen something in this plant and something about it drew us. Maybe yeah. and I love it. And so we still have this connection with it in a natural mm -hmm. history sense. I love that. Yeah. Um, well, that's actually a good turning point too to kind of open the door for you to kind of share with us what your research is. What is your current research looking at, uh, if you don't mind? Definitely. Yeah. So I've looked at hybridization in sunflowers before. Um, so hybridization is just we think of species as being independent of each other completely, but plants especially just love to break rules. Plants are total rule breakers, and I definitely um, can relate to that sometimes. So <laughs> Only sometimes. So <laughs> hybridization is essentially when two different plant species can interbreed together and produce viable seeds for offspring. So essentially, you know, sunflower species A can mate with sunflower species B and then produce this new thing, which is like half A and B. And then is it a C? Is it, you know, what's going on with that? Um, so essentially hybridization can generate lots of diversity in terms of what they look like. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. That? Just to clarify, because mm -hmm. I... In my brain, I was thinking about hybrids as being like not able to have babies. Is that different? If just to be yeah, okay, it's it's is totally, it a whole can of worms or yeah, it totally depends okay. on how you define a species. Um, so oh. I think you know the way that most of us are taught about species, it's like you know they're interbreeding and they can produce viable, fertile offspring. So that's why you know the classic example of hybridization is. A horse plus a donkey equals a mule, but mules can't reproduce. So right. that's why horses and donkeys are separate. Um, plants just love to break those rules. And there definitely are examples of animal hybrids also. But plants especially love to break those rules. There's evidence of ferns that have, um, their la the last time they were shared an ancestor. So you can think about like last time you shared an ancestor with the siblings, a parent, with a cousins, a grandparent, and so on and so forth. There are ferns that last shared an ancestor 60 million years ago, and they can just interbreed because oh plants do what they want. So, okay. well, thank you yeah. for that clarification. I just yeah. wanted to make sure I was following you. Please, no, go. definitely, because yeah. that's—I mean—that's how we're taught about hybrids. Like, oh, they're you know, they're mules, and mules are good for carrying things, but that's about mm -hmm. it, right? right. But yeah. okay, so you study the kind that can make fertile mm -hmm. seeds. Yeah, cool. yeah, and hybrids can actually generate lots of diversity because you take like species A and species B and they look different, but then you combine them and then you combine those offspring. And instead of having like, you know, a trait value, whatever, like leaf size, that's like this size or this size, you can actually get a huge combination because of the way that complicated, but the way the genomes combine, you can just generate a lot of variation. And that's one way you can potentially create new species or at least new, um, new shapes to those plants, new fun new ways of functioning. So I looked at hybridization in sunflowers down in Texas, looking at hybridization between these two different species. And we did this eight year field experiment where we planted hybrids um, that we generated in the lab just by like, you move pollen back and forth between plants to, and then harvest the seeds. Um, so it's very, very technical. Um, do that in the greenhouse and then plant those out in the field for eight years and we can harvest seeds and then plant them all in one place in the same time. And um, monitor them and then see how they've actually evolved over eight years. And so that's super cool because, um, you know, if you see a difference in a plant from one year to the next, it could be like, oh, well, maybe, maybe there's actually an evolutionary change that's, you know, fixed and heritable, or maybe it was really dry one year and really wet the next year. And so the plant just looks different because it had a different growing environment, different resources. But if we take all those generations, generation one through eight, Put them in the same place at the same time with you know the sample size and like all the statistics um turns out that hybrids can actually evolve really quickly like within eight generations they can evolve both in terms of like how many seeds they produce and in terms of different traits related to leaves and their branching architecture and all these other things we looked at like 27 different traits and um the hybrids evolved faster than the non-hybrids did Whoa. which was pretty remarkable 
Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. They're super cool. I mean, and it's testing some of these old ideas or, you know, traditional ideas about hybrids, but I think the more we know, the more we actually look at hybrids again, based partially on natural history and then like following up on those things, um, the more we see like examples of hybrids that are, you know, their own species or that evolve more quickly or anything like that. So it's really exciting and really fun to work on these things. Um, so actually that's work that I'm still doing some work with that, but now that I'm up in the Midwest, um, upper Midwest in Wisconsin, the great thing about sunflowers in North America is that they're pretty much everywhere. So I've been working with undergraduate students here at uh, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and we've been looking at population genetics. So thinking about how um, different species of closely related sunflowers, how genetically distinct they are, um, how mm -hmm. what they look like varies across the landscapes, across Wisconsin, um, just seeing how their leaves and other traits differ uh, related to things like precipitation and temperature. And also looking for evidence of whether or not they injure fruit, because back in like the the 40s and 50s, there was there's some research done looking at um, saying there's evidence for hybridization in these plants based mm -hmm. largely off of like the, the shape of the plant. Like it doesn't look like this one or this one looks kind of in between. So mm -hmm. it must be a hybrid. And so we've been seeing if there's evidence for that at the genetic level, um, which has been really rewarding to work with students on those questions. Oh, that's so cool. Um, and I know, okay, so you're also studying like exclusively the native ones. I mean, I just want to, yeah. so what, yes. why kind of, why, why are native sunflowers so important? Why, because I know there's a, a ton of species as you mm -hmm. shared with us. Why does it matter so much that we learn as much as we can about the native sunflowers? And maybe I guess the follow-up question that I'll come back to is like, how do we encourage them? How do we help them grow in our areas? Yeah. yeah, that's a yeah. great question. Great point. <laughs> so I think there are there are two re there are two main reasons to think about these native species and these wild species really, and one is more human um you know one's more human centric and one's a little bit more nature centric. So the human centric reason is that because we do use sunflowers as a like crop species, the more we know about their wild relatives, the better. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, if you know with increasing drought, if there are species that tolerate drought really well we can understand how they do that, what genes are involved, we can potentially, you know, use hybridization to then increase drought tolerance in our crops, for instance, or resistance to different herbivores in our crop species. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a human centric view. And I definitely appreciate that. I think, you know, it is worth a lot of money, people's livelihoods depend on these things. And you know, it's an important oil crop for nutrition. On the more nature centric side, um, a lot of other species depend on sunflowers. They have mm -hmm. um, lots of other organisms. So thinking holistically about kind of all the other plant species that exist with the sun, that coexist with these sunflowers, uh, think about maintaining those native uh, or natural habitats. So a lot of these will exist in prairie areas, which are or different types of grasslands, um, which are under threat from things like agriculture and, uh, you know, domesticated animals as well and just the natural services they provide. And then a lot of native pollinators are also very important for, mm -hmm. um, for sunflowers too. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, wait, so native pollinators are important. What native pollinators do, what pollinate sunflowers? Okay. So sunflowers <laughs> are mostly pollinated by bees. Okay. Um, but when I say bee, you know, and this is, I'm definitely guilty of this too. When I when I say bee, people will typically either picture like a bumblebee, a cute little fur, fuzzy bumblebee, yeah. or a honeybee, because okay. you know honey is delicious. Um, and people talk a lot about honeybee decline, which is definitely a thing in colony collapse disorder. Um, but honeybees are certainly not the only bees out there. Honeybees are not even native to to the Americas at all. Um, so it's the European honeybee that often we're relying on for a lot of our crop pollination services. And so to get to get the fruits or the food that we want, we often rely on these European honeybees. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many native bees out there. And so a couple of things about these native bee pollinators, um, they're incredibly diverse. So uh, I'm actually, we're working on publishing a study um, that one of my colleagues did in New Mexico, where she was looking at these historical records of what pollinators were existing on just sunflowers. So look, just looking at wild, popula wild populations of these sunflowers in Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern California. So looking at just those three states, the pollinators on these sunflowers. 
Um, and so there were these studies done in the 1970s look assessing that. And then she went back in 2015, 2016 to look at the same, basically replicate those methods and think about how they've changed since the 70s. Mm. So again, replicating the study, same pretty much places, but just going to these sunflower fields and seeing who's on just the sunflowers, kind of ignoring uh, the other plant species there. And so what's really cool is um, in 2015, 2016, she found 87 different species of bees on these pollinators, on these oh. sunflowers. Wait, species of bees? 87 different species of bees. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh my gosh. How many bees are there in that area? You don't know. Like, I'm not sure exactly how many, lot. but that it's a lot. Yeah. Okay, more than 80. 30. More than 80. Wow. So, you know, definitely one of those was honeybees for sure. Yeah. Um, and honeybees had increased a lot since the 1970s until the, you know, 2015, 2016. But most of them were, okay. So when we think about bees, there's two general types of bees in terms of the relationship with plants, at least. Mm -hmm. They're what we call generalist pollinators and specialist pollinators. Okay. So these specialists, they're like, you know, they're only visiting maybe a couple species, maybe only one species of plants, maybe a handful of species, but they're like pretty, they're like, they only like this one kind of plant and that's they what they're going favorite. after. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They have their cool. favorite and they're not going to deviate from that favorite. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the generalist ones are like, we'll take anything, right? Like no. I see a flower, I want to visit it. They'll you need know, these generalist species of which honeybees are one. They'll just like go after pretty much anything. Um, and so there's a mix of both, both generalist and specialist bees that like sunflowers. Um, some flowers are so bright, they have this big landing pad and lots of nectar and pollen for rewards. So the pollinators are getting food from it and the um, plant is moving pollen so that they can reproduce essentially. Um, so the specialists in general, there's like bees that are called sunflower bees that are found there. The other really fun thing about these bees is that we usually think of, you know, honeycombs and a beehive and the queen, and all of her workers and the drones and stuff like that, which is definitely the case for honeybees. But most of these bees are actually solitary bees. So they just, oh. you know, exist on their lonely lifestyle, but they like it that way. They're like introvert bees. They don't live in a big colony. They like just do their own thing. Um, and so some of those bees, you know, are a lot of solitary ones and they'll nest underground instead of having beehives. Um, so a lot of those native bees, which are not as visible because it may not be as many of them, or they might not be as, you know, showy as, you know, they're not all black and yellow striped either. So they might not even be recognized as bees. A lot of those depend on some of these native sunflowers. Oh, oh that's great. So by like planting native sunflowers that are native to our area, we can encourage all these native Definitely. pollinators, particularly yeah. native bees. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Do other things pollinated too, or bees are just the number one? Or bees, you know? are the, bees are the number one. I think there have been studies that show that like there's other species that will visit the sunflowers okay. and some of them are better pollinators than others so like flies will visit sometimes but they don't necessarily move the pollen as well as bees okay. um, flies what else some beetles as well and sense. then part of the natural history is you know when i'm in the field i often we have these field sites where we come twice a week to look at the sunflowers and just the things you find on them they may or may not be pollinating but just like in Texas, there were katydids everywhere, and there were on the on the sunflowers. There were um, praying mantises living there. Uh, there were fi fire ants, which were less fun um, <laughs> to be handling. Um, and up here in Wisconsin, we have these golden orb weavers, orb weaving spiders that are there, and just seeing this kind of like little community, the ambush bugs too, like oh, oh cool weevils and all sorts of things that are eating things so it's like this little mini ecosystem just on a sunflower plant which is okay. really fascinating and you know they may or may not be pollinating but they're there and they're doing their thing too yeah can I just also draw a full circle here where yeah. as a child your chore was going out and collecting flowers and as a grown-up your chore is going out and looking at flowers in a field twice a week definitely like your dreams can come true everyone I know <laughs> That's I will. Uh, the other thing about my childhood love of plants is that I had this little plant press as yeah, like a, I can't remember how old I was when I first got one. I was like maybe five or six, like pretty young. That's Essentially, really it's like pieces of cardboard, just like pieces yeah. of cardboard. And then you put newspaper and take a plant but in the newspaper. And then like it's got straps to strap it down. Yeah. And then my 
my field botany course in college, you know, as a 20 year old or whatever I was like doing the same thing. And like, you know, to this day, just like working with these pressed specimens. This is a sunflower um, that we have at our herbarium here in Eau Claire, which is basically like a plant museum and dried plant yeah. museum. This one was collected in the 1960s um, mm. from out, you know, pretty close to Eau Claire. So, you know, I also collect these specimens and press them and I have my students do the same thing. So it really is full circle. So you've never changed anything about yourself. <laughs> you know, my hair was not always like this color, your hair. But, ba but basically, yeah. I love that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask Nora one more question, everyone. So you have your questions for her. You can put them in the Q&A at the bottom here and we'll get to them in just a minute. Um, so, okay, well, I guess I have two more quick questions because yeah. one is I'm kind of going to bring it back to the natural history thing, which mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that you've kind of woven in throughout everything you've talked about tonight. It was really helpful. Um, so I know as a scientist, the natural history is often looked down on by science. Mm -hmm. Like it's thought of as like too simplistic, not really relative. It's like something that like non-scientists do. Can you speak to this? Yeah, I think because people think of natural history as being, you know, very just like feelings oriented and it mm -hmm. is, but it's all, but that's it not is. all it is. It's really important, right? It's important to have those observations to root your science in. And, you know, as a scientist, it's not like I'm only going out and looking at plants and like seeing them. I'm also collecting data and doing analyses and writing about them, stuff like that. But I think that natural history is a really important base. And these natural history observations are really important a lot of species interactions, especially like the way species relate to each other, are really important and often are like start as anecdotal or like stories like, hey, I saw this one thing. And then you dive more into that and then you make some really amazing scientific discoveries. Mm -hmm. And I know there are some scientific journals now that have like recognized how important that is and the fact that it's been devalued for a while now. Um, and have like special, special types of articles, like a natural history note where you can make, you know, mm -hmm. publish something about something you've noticed and have a little bit of data, but it's not necessarily like oodles and oodles of data coming out, come, you know, yeah. not drowning in data, but like, hey, there's this one really cool thing. This is what we observe, how we observe it. This is why it's important. And then you can build off of that and share that knowledge, share that natural history knowledge to, you know, further all sorts of questions. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And I loved how you described it as stories because for me, as both of us are ecologists by training. Mm -hmm. And so I think of that's how I kind of explain ecology too. It's like it's it's an easier leap for me because the ecology is already telling the story of plants and animals in nature and how they're interacting with each other and their environment. So exactly. you're like trying to build that story. So it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, just maybe data or I mean there can be data in natural history too, but yeah, cool. Definitely. Well, let me turn to the Q&A and then we'll wrap things up quickly at the end. So let's yeah. see what people, you don't have to worry about it. I'll just okay. <laughs> so, <anyway. laughs> okay. so there's some uploaded ones. I'll start with, okay. So first about the anatomy, um, mm -hmm. each disc flower has both pistil and stamen with the stamens emerging first. Is that how that works? Yes, pretty much. So, and then this is mainly in Helianthus. There are other, like others in the family that are different. It's again, it's like 33, 34,000. So there's variation okay. there, but yeah. So it first goes from being unopened and then it goes through the male phase that has the stamens and the anthers and the pollen. Okay. And then after that's done, it'll go through the female phase with the stigma and style and ovaries. Um, then pollen will be, you know, if pollen go, if that stigma receives pollen, then it'll be fertilized and produce the seed. But yeah, each one of those will go through it as long as they develop properly and, and don't get eaten or anything like that. Or here in Wisconsin, sometimes they'll start to develop and then they'll freeze. And so they won't all necessarily get there, but that's like, that's how it should work essentially. Okay. And Anne wants to know as a follow-up, do the inside flowers develop if you pick the flower or do they stop? They will to some extent. So I definitely tried this because I you know the, the patterning is so cool in the way the development happens. And I wanted to take pictures in like a more controlled setting. So I like took one, a wild sunflower, cut it and like put it in a bowl of water. So it could like just float there. And I took a picture every day and it started doing it. And then like after I think five or six days, it like was done. <laughs> I love so that we did a science experiment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely will continue. And I think it depends on, you know, I wasn't controlling the conditions. It wasn't in the fridge or and it was just like on my kitchen table, but um, yeah. they will continue to develop, but maybe not all the way. They still need, they're still missing some nutrients that they probably need that I was definitely not providing them in that context. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Here's another quickie. Um, can you give us the title and author of that sunflower field book you shared? Yes, it is the sunflower family. I'll type it in the chat. I think. Okay. I can sunflower also do it eventually. Family by whom? Um, Richard, Richard Spellenberg, S P is it, is it backwards? I got it. No, okay. Good. Zucker. And Spellenberg Maria and Zucker. Okay. And Nadia Zucker. <laughs> Nadia, yeah. Nadia. Just last names. Reading Great. backwards is hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, here's a question from uh, a local, uh, mm -hmm. Annie Pig, who I believe is at the Coconino Forest. He wants to know Have you ever had a chance to work with Helianth Helianthus Arizonian Arizonensis? I'm sorry. I, just I have not. I Ooh. would love to, but so, you know, um, I'll have to come visit Arizona sometime <laughs> soon. Obviously, I've worked in New Mexico, but when I was living in New Mexico, I was actually working on a project based in Texas. So I was, you know, seeing sunflowers in New Mexico, but I wasn't studying them. And then I was, um, I've been to Arizona, but not for mm. work specifically. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll have to come visit. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have you in person. That would be great. Um, here's a sciencey one. Which is more important to attract pollinators in the sunflower, terpenes or nectars? Ooh, so I think it depends on the species probably. Um, mm -hmm. So let me think. So for the pollinators, some of them are collecting, um, some of them are more collecting pollen and some of them are collecting nectar. Okay. So for the, oh, I'm trying to think of like how to weight those. The terpenes are often used against seed predation. Okay. So oh, those, the, are the, those are the chemicals? Is that yeah, like, these okay. terpenes, and they have these you know, very specialized terpenes called sesquiterpene lactones. And oh. like the chemical oh. structure of those, I could not tell you because I actually never took organic chemistry, um, fun fact, what? but <laughs> I know. I never knew I, that. I got away <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, but these terpenes are often um, kind of trying to discourage things from eating them. Again, they could have, there's lots of different sesquiterpene lactones out there. Um, sesquiterpene, diterpene, all sorts of these, you know, this kind of overall class or brand of chemicals, but they often will actually be deterring things from eating the plant, either mm. eating the leaves or eating uh, the seeds. Whereas the nectar is a reward and they're trying to attract pollinators. Okay. And so there's this with, um, with plant insect interactions, there's like, positive and negative, you know, we can think about um, positive interactions or antagonistic interactions. So plants want to interact the, the insects they want, and they want to like deter the insects they don't want. Um, yeah. So plants want their pollen moved, they want the nectar drank, but they don't want their leaves eaten or um, seeds eaten either. Okay. And so there's obviously lots of diversity in those lactones, but overall their function is most mostly as a deterrent. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so Lee wants to know, what results did you find in your multi-year study of the hybridization in Texas? Yeah, so it was really fascinating. Um, they, yeah, the hybrids evolved faster. So interestingly, the hybrid reproductive output, like the first generation ones was very low, like very mm -hmm. low. They weren't, they were producing seeds, but not as many as their, as the non-hybrids. Um, but within just those eight generations, their fitness or their reproductive output actually exceeded the non-hybrids in our studies, um, was about equal to or exceeded, um, depending on which site we looked at. Um, and so there's a bunch of other changes in terms of what the traits look like. So we looked at, again, 27 different traits, and most of them evolved quicker in the hybrids and the non-hybrids. And then we also did this study. So this is the fun part about field work. We did this study and we had two final sites, one in Austin, Texas, and one um, outside Houston, Texas, actually south of Houston, closer to um, like Galveston area. And we did this in 2017, which is when Hurricane Harvey hit. So we had oh. about 1,100 plants in each garden. And after Hurricane Harvey hit, we had 33 <gasps> plants in that garden. So yeah. That, yeah. That was not a big enough sample size to look at things, but um, we buckled up and redid that garden in 2019. And so we have results that also show that, you know, a lot of these changes are consistent across locations and across years also. So the hybrids evolve faster and fairly repeatably kind of predict how they would evolve in one place based on how they evolved at the other place too, which was cool. Nice. Thanks, Nora. Um, okay. Just a couple more. Yeah. Uh, 
If you're pressing flowers, how do you preserve the color? Is there a product? How do you do it? What's the best way? It's hard and they just don't preserve as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's just, yeah. In general, um, it helps to harvest the plant and press it pretty quickly. Um, but just over time, they will degrade. And there's been studies looking at, you know, you can do some things to help prevent that. But overall, it's really difficult. And then some colors will degrade faster than others because of just the chemical compounds that give those different plants those colors. So like the yellows and the reds are different families and like the purples and blues. Um, but yeah, it's hard. Um, as a kid, I would like try to color coordinate things for like pieces of art and to they, they faded for sure. Even like this one, you can see one, like when they dry up, they like definitely don't look yeah. as good. <laughs> yeah. Looks a little bit sad, but you can still see like, this is, these are the disc florets. These are the ray ones. Um, But yeah. And then if they're really three-dimensional, sometimes you can put them in a little cardboard box, like a, a water lily, for instance, which is very three-dimensional. It's like, how would you flatten that out and preserve what it looks like? You can put those in a little box with silica beads or silica gel. Like, and uh, if you buy new shoes, a little packets of silica that keep it dry. Mm -hmm. um, like bigger pieces of that essentially will dry it out, preserve it in three dimensional form to some extent, at least. But oh. it's hard. Yeah, they just don't look the same. Just the way like taxidermy is an art, preserving plant specimens is an art, and um, doesn't always look quite the same. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a couple more. Uh, yeah. Elise wants to know, uh, what were you studying at Isle Royale? Could you briefly talk about that? Yeah. So my undergrad advisor, um, she was looking a lot at the Great Lakes, Great Lakes Arctic disjunct plants. So they're these plants that will grow like up towards the Arctic and then some that will grow like in Lake Superior, which is a big you know, big gap in terms of geographic space. So we were looking, we were doing long-term studies kind of tracking how these plants were growing on the shoreline. So remember, we were like printing out all these maps about where these plants were. And at first, like I was new to the project. I was like, oh, these maps, must this line must be a trail to this place. And then um, quickly realized like, oh, that line here, that's a crack in the rock here where this plant is found. So these tiny little plants on the shoreline, we were looking at those. We were also looking at pollinator networks, actually, um, pollinator networks associated with the bunchberry dogwood. Um, this low growing plant found there. And we were actually tracking a new species of um Senecio, which is in the Astra family actually they discovered a new species there we were tracking like the number of individuals and how many flowers and seeds they were they were producing every year and stuff like that too so a couple of different projects you know long-term projects are really great because you can train undergrads to work on them and they can contribute but also most undergrads are only there for a year so they're not going to be able to see an entire project through from start to finish often they can gain a lot of skills and contribute in different ways to those ongoing projects that's great. Um, so through the Q&A, we got an offer of a job, kind of. So, so Andy followed up um, and said that if you're interested in H. arizonensis, then he can probably put in some grants. He can get you out to study. You know. So yes. <laughs> maybe you can connect after this. Andy, you yeah, can email definitely. me. I'll give you Nora's email if you want. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you're interested, I can connect you too. Yeah, that'd be um, awesome. And finally, I saved this one because I think it's a great final one. Um, what would you say is the biggest secret of sunflowers? No whispers. I think the biggest secret is that I just think the number of rules that they break, you know, you think of plants are rules, like, you know, that's a flower. Like, no, that's thousands of flowers actually. Like, or, you know, those are two different species. Actually, they'll do whatever they want and they'll mate freely and they'll, you know, um, so I think those are two pretty big secrets and not that they're well-kept secrets necessarily, but there are things that I think aren't well known. Um, so those are some of their secrets at least. Um, yeah, just their their free love philosophy and their um, the way they kind of hide themselves. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nora, for being here. Thank you for everyone who tuned in. I think we're just about out of time. Yeah. So it's been so great talking to you, Nora. You yes. Me thank so you much so about much. Sunflowers. I had no idea. Um, and thank you so much for spending this time with us on your evening. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone else for joining us. And again, mention the Natural History Institute's website, naturalhistoryinstitute.org. You can support our work there if you choose. And our YouTube channel is a wonderful resource where this presentation will be out tomorrow in its edited form. So if you want to share it, please do. Um, so with that, thank you all so much again for joining us. And thank you, Nora, for being here. And good night.
Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining everyone. Bye. <laughs>